So we actually have a variety of programs uh, for the eSports Association. One is career readiness. So we actually work with the Career Center here to better prepare our association members to learn those life skills that they are going to need so that when they make that transition over to a career pathway. Awesome, awesome. This guy, this guy, we got to turn around. This guy wins almost every tournament we throw. <laughs> we got to watch the live. CSUDH Esports Association is centered in four domains, academics and research, community engagement, competition, and entertainment. We're trying to make sure that the students are prepared for the future, that they understand the diversity that media offers now, and again, look beyond the traditional outlets. They can gain fieldwork, partnerships, as well as potential job opportunities, and in both the higher education and, and K-12 fields, we believe that esports is a strategy and not an outcome. Our association is here to help anyone that is willing to learn how to take your gaming skills to the next level through a supporting community. If you are looking to showcase your production talents to help support our esports teams, then this is the association for you. We host online and on-site tournaments that will allow our members to showcase their competitive spirit. Our association broadcasts out our competition and practices to entertain our community as well as our global audience. We believe that by joining us, you will come out of the association feeling transformed and better prepared to transfer your skills into your career. Join today and begin to explore endless opportunities through our eSports Association here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for logging in. I just want to thank you all uh, for attending. Uh, I just want to do some quick announcements before I do any introductions. And that is that uh, you're in a safe space. You can ask any question you'd like under the chat option. Uh, just keep in mind that in our channel, we do have some rules just to keep uh, cognizant about. And at the same time, we do have other social media outlets that you can follow us in as well. All right. Today we have a special guest, and uh, she is no stranger to esports. She is our esports psychology educator. She works in the Department of Psychology here at California State University, Dominguez Hills. And today's session will be about cognition and language, microaggressions, and macroaggressions. Without any further ado, please give a warm welcome in the chat to Professor Monique Turner. Monique, take over the mic. All right, thank you. Um, so I'll transition to um, my PowerPoint and just kind of start off with um, why we chose to kind of focus in on cognition and language. Um, last week, we kind of had an open mic and we talked about racism and we shared different experiences. And I think it's really important that we talk about the thought process and how these different microaggressions or macroaggressions kind of are developed um, in our brains and kind of understanding the, the underlying mechanisms of how we see different behaviors and actions, I think is really important. And so today I'll just briefly talk about cognition and language and kind of give um, different examples of microaggressions and macroaggressions. And so, my first slide, does everybody see my first slide? I'm assuming it says cogn okay, cognitive processing. Um, so I want to kind of start off with this quote um, and it's from Waldwin in 1946. And basically it says the law of thought 
Everything on a physical plane is the exteriorization of a thought which must be balanced by one who generated it according to his responsibility. So if you break that down, it, it basically is saying that any thought that we have is manifested through the self and, it, and then it's expressed outwardly. And so whatever we say or whatever we do is a result of our internal aspects. And so that's where that cognition piece kind of comes in. It's how we think about ourselves, how we think about others. Um, what we just think about the, in the environment is really important as well. And so it kind of takes us to this concept called mental representations. And mental representations is another word for your memory. So anything that you've experienced, rather it be a person, an emotion, a location, it, it started with some type of experience. And that experience was coded into your brain via a mental representation or a memory. And so when we see different stimulus in the environment, whether it be people or objects, we automatically associate it with the knowledge that we previously had. So say for instance, I see a, a computer and I had a good experience with the computer. I played the game, I won. So when I see the computer again, I'm gonna remember that last experience and I'm gonna, it's gonna maybe excite me or lead to happiness. But if you had a negative experience with the computer, then the opposite would occur. And so it's very important that we understand that the representation of different objects and different people in the environment, it conveys some type of information to our own functioning. And then we lead to some type of action, like a motor response. And so that dyad is really important. And to kind of further understand mental representations, they come into different aspects. So one is the format. Format is just size, color, shape just basically describing what it looks like. And then the second is the content. So whatever meaning you attach to it, and it's referred to semantic um, meaning. And you add some type of emotion, thought, experience related to it. And then so you develop these mental representations and they lead to some type of, um, some type of perception of the event. And you, and you hold on to that perception of whatever you occurred or whatever experience you had. And so that experience can be different for ethnic minorities or people who are classified as um, a minority group. Um, and sometimes we have these experiences, these different thoughts that kind of reside in our minds. And we're not necessarily sure if it's a reality or if it's a situation that somebody kind of gave to us. And so I'm going to go to the next slide. And so process, the processing system leads to specific outcomes. So however we process information, that leads to a particular behavior at least to a, partic a particular word that we say verbally or something that we do. And so whatever we have in our mind, we have interpreted it. Um, it, it refers to how we respond to it and then how, how also we react to different stimulus that we continuously see in the environment. And so if you can really take that in, if you see people, and if we're talking about um, microaggressions, typically it's um, related to a target group or population. So as soon as you see that person, you're gonna have a memory of a previous experience or what somebody told you about that group. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind that that might influence your behaviors and how you interact with other people. And so ethnic minorities who feel threatened usually know that a stereotype exists uh, about them or about their group. And that stereotype is based off the knowledge and experience that that person had or whoever told them that. So it's, it, it's very important to understand that these stereotypes are developed over time and they're nurtured based off our experiences in the present moment. And so when, while you're playing esports, it, you know, it's really important that we are aware of our environment. So we are aware of our team members who we're, who we're working with or who we're playing with, also aware of our own mental health how we feel, if we feel happy or sad or anxious that day, all of that awareness allows us to be more present in the moment. And it allows us to make more informed decisions and also to have a different type of problem solving technique, as opposed to if we're in a, if we're in a, like a negative space, we're gonna act negatively as opposed to being in a positive space. And kind of my philosophy, philosophy is focused on positive psychology is trying to focus in on what we can do right, what is in our control, but also balancing that with the situations that we have to deal with that might not be so positive. And so we have to also be aware of our sensations, our perceptions, our, mo our moods, our emotions, and our thoughts. 
can it, it helps us to understand what we're going through, what we're experiencing it, and how we can cope with it. And that's the most important part is how we cope with the things that we experience because we can't necessarily control everything that we experience. And sometimes the things that we experience are unfair and they're unjust, but you can still have control of your response. And that is what this um, presentation is gonna kind of speak about. And so within esports, um, honestly, um, esports can be familiar to um, similar, excuse me, similar to physical education. And it's kind of being more promoted um, within the literature of how esports is actually good for development. And so I kind of listed a few things that you can develop skills that you can de develop by playing esports, such as motor skills. And so it helps you with balance and coordination and also response time. I mean, also helps you to develop communication. And that is the part of the language. What are we saying to our team members? What are we saying on the Discord chat? How are we communicating different words? Are we using healthy language? How are we collaborating together? Are we working together with our team members or are we going against them? Are we being inclusive? Or are we excluding individuals? And then that kind of leads to that concept of teamwork. You know, when you're working on esports or if you're playing a, a physical education sport, um, you want to focus on how you can kind of interact with other people, the goals, um, focusing on the goals and how they can kind of relate to each other. And so if you have all these different skills, it leads to more optimal performance. So if you have motor skills, you have communication, you have collaboration, and you have teamwork, it develops higher performance in you as an individual. And so this concept of motor learning, um, typically we learn through experience. And so we have like, I have this the model and you have the cognition and then you have the association and then you have automatic. And so first, cognitively, you have to think, you know, when, whatever we do, there's always gonna be some type of thought that's associated with it. And if we understand that, then we know esports is helping us to develop our thought process because we have to think about something before we move. We have to think about if we're gonna hurdle or if we're gonna jump. And so that is all going on cognitively simultaneously while you're trying to respond. And so once you start to have the thought and then you understand your environment, how to interact, when not to respond, when to jump, when to move, when to talk, right? All of that is going into the association. And so over the association period, which can be relatively over a year, or sometimes it can be um, a little quicker. If you think about when you learn to walk, when children learn to walk, you know, it takes time for them to kind of get their balance, to hold on to the couch to walk, and then eventually they start to walk by themselves. And so during that period, when they first started to stand up until they're walking by themselves is an association period that they're learning, well, if I do this, well, I fall. If I do that, I'm going to fall. And it's the, kind of the same concept when you are learning anything in the environment, especially with esports. You're learning what will work, what will be more of a balance, what will lead to more points, what will lead to less points. Um, and so then it becomes automatic. And so that you're not necessarily thinking about the steps that you're making or the buttons that you're pressing on the control. You're just automatically doing it because you've already learned it. And so that whole concept is referred to motor learning. So we learn a lot in esports and we have to be mindful of the thoughts that we hold in our mind while we're learning. And so it kind of takes me to microaggressions. And this is just like a brief um, description of what microaggressions are. Um, and typically, um, they're subtle. They're everyday verbal and nonverbal slights that individuals say toward different targeted groups. Um, and sometimes most of the people who say these statements are unaware that they're microaggressions. They're unaware that it's hurtful. And sometimes when the targeted population actually um, says like, you know, what you just said to me was hurtful, you know, it's challenging for a person to do that especially if you are of a ethnic nationality. Um, I try to stay away from the word of minority because I don't think we're minorities. I think we are the majority of the population. But if we are classified in that, in that way, we might feel that we are not allowed to kind of address the different feelings that we have. And so we have to be mindful of that, the language that we use verbally, and then what we actually write down, which is really important. And so it can also be insults, which are communicated um, hostilely and um, derogatorily, or they might have negative mes message about your age, your gender, your ethnicity, or your nationality. Um, and it's usually based on a marginalized group membership, classified as quotations minorities. 
Um, and also invalidates a positive group identity. So if you feel you have a high confidence or you have um, a high positive identity, typically these different statements seek to diminish that identity. And so then we kind of go back to that cognitive processing. So we have to understand that, yes, people are going to say things, people are going to do things, but at the end of the day, we are in control of our response and what we allow to sit in our minds and our bodies and our souls and our spirits. And we have to be mindful of that because everything is not invited in. Everything should not be welcomed in. And we have the control of what we choose to include or not include. And so it also leads to relegating groups to an inferior status and of treatment. And oftentimes you will feel like you're inferior. You will feel like you're treated badly. And, and that was the intent of a microaggression, whether they were consciously aware or they were not aware at all. It still made you feel some type of way. And so there's three different types. So one, we have micro assault. And a micro assault is blatant, verbal, nonverbal, or environmental attack intended to convey discriminatory or biased sentiments. And basically, this could be an example of somebody throwing something at you or pushing you down. Or it could be like a comment saying that you are bad or calling you out your name directly saying it. And so you obviously can read it or you can obviously see the behavior and you know that was meant to hurt. You. So that's more obvious. Um, the micro insult is more so not so obvious and oftentimes it's unintentional from the individual. And but it can be verbal comments that convey rudeness, insensitivity, or demean a person's racial heritage, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And so this, this concept kind of gets at the root of the definition for microaggressions in the language that we use. Um, the other type is a micro invalidation. And this refers to verbal comments or behaviors that exclude, negate, or dismiss psychological thoughts, feelings, or exper experiential reality of the targeted group. And so this is the example of if a targeted person says that person B said something to you that hurt your feelings, and then person B says, I didn't hurt your feelings, I didn't mean to do that, you are invalidating the other person's feelings. And so that could be a type of microaggression. We always have to acknowledge if we wrote a comment that wasn't nice or it wasn't kind, we have to be willing to acknowledge where we went wrong and how we can improve our behaviors. But if we're not open cognitively to the process of accepting that we need to improve our language, whether it be verbally or non-verbally, then how can we change as a, as, a, as a nation? We can't change. We have to have some type of awareness and we have to validate other people's feelings and thoughts. And we, have, and we can do that within the chat, within the discord, within our verbal communication with other people. And so these are other types of microaggressions. And again, just to summarize, is a subjective interpretation based on the individual's experience. And subjective just means you. You are different from another person. So you might feel hurt while another person that might look like you or have a similar background might not feel hurt. But that does not mean that just because that person doesn't um, hurt doesn't mean that your hurt is any less than. So it's subjective to the individual. Um, and I have a question mark next that should be addressed because sometimes, you know, people uh, kind of go back and forth that they should challenge or address a person that says a microaggression toward them. And that, that's kind of up to you what, what you should do. But I, I believe that you should advocate for yourself. And it's a way that you advocate for yourself in a healthy way that you don't necessarily offend the other person. And that could be via chat, like, hey, you know, I wasn't really kind what you said, because you maybe use a different type of language next time, and maybe set a time that you guys can talk about it. Because a lot of times people don't understand that they are saying a microaggression and they just don't get it. They don't get it because of the word privilege. And when people have a background in which they're privileged, their their sight and their lens is not able to see your perspective. It, it, they just can't see it. And, and you have like this research, you have this data, you have these different articles. And then the other person that is the targeted person is like, wow, how don't you see how you can change? How don't you see how I'm feeling? And so that, that dialogue has to exist in some type of way. Um, and so some of the messages that can be conveyed to individuals are you don't, you do not belong. You don't belong here. You are abnormal. You are intellectually inferior. 
you you are all the same and you are not trustworthy and so different behaviors and different comments can send this message but they use different words to send that message and i'll show a few examples of that so this website this website is really awesome it's called microaggressions.com and what i did is just, i went there and i searched for sports you can look for gender you can look for age you can look for academics you look for any topic that you want and microaggressions will come up but this one is focused on race and i'm just going to read a couple and you know just pay attention to how you feel as i read it what are some thoughts that are coming up um because that is where you kind of get into that that bias thought process to see if you are actually understanding what is being said and what is wrong with what is being said and so for example um some girl asked me today if i played sports i just said no because i didn't feel like talking after she replied but you're tall big and black doesn't every big black person at the school play some type of sport and so from that statement you can kind of see where the stereotype comes in right if a person is classified as big and black they automatically play sports but that's not necessarily true all the time just because you are a certain height or a certain weight it does not mean that you play sports all the time you, you can be you can love history you can love science right you can love to draw and so that is a stereotype that is being projected to this other person, this targeted group. Um, and then another one, let's see. I'm not surprised there are so many police around urban minority populated schools. I played sports against some of the, those schools and those kids are scary. I was afraid I'd get stabbed. I like, my, I like my guts on the inside of me. Thank you very much. And so you can kind of tell like, it that person is being really sarcastic toward the end like i like my guts thank you very much so that's inferring that being around this population rather it be in compton rather it be in south la west la not necessarily west la i would say but more so south la and east la you know you kind of have this perception that these students or these children are going to act a particular way and that is based off stereotype that that individual learned from somewhere or that was taught to them from a particular institution and so having this comment this is not this might be true for some but it's not true for everybody and for a person to make the statement it is definitely a microaggression because it, it it can be hurtful to individuals as i was reading it i was i was it was hard for me to read because it was hurtful to read because i, I don't say things like this and i try to be mindful of what i'm saying and how i'm communicating and so that's what i want to I encourage you all to do is definitely take a look at this website and just kind of explore it and it actually was a research study that they were looking at microaggressions and how they impact um, different populations but just take a look at it to read some of them so that you can get an idea about what these microaggressions sound like and what they um, look like if you type them in a chat or while you're communicating via digital uh, domains and then i have Two examples of gender. So this kind of gets at gender. And I thought this was interesting because um, some people can have the thought that females or males classified by biological sex um, do not like to play esports or do not like to play sports. And that could be false. You know, women as well as men, cisgender, transsexual, transgender, we all have different differences and, and we can share those differences in the way that we want to but we should not be judged or evaluated by our gender if we like a certain sport or not. And so an example of that one is, let me see where it was at. Oh, okay, here. So on the first day of my 10th grade PE class, the teacher informs me, informs my class that girls can't play sports. So we should all expect to receive low marks. However, he thoughtfully reassures us that if it doesn't make us make us bad people that it doesn't make us bad people so from that statement girls in in that instance were excluded from even trying to get a good grade and, and that's that's a microaggression for that teacher to say that a teacher should not say that to any student a teacher should not speak to you at all like that it, it, it's unallowed and sometimes due to lack of knowledge we don't know what people are saying if it's okay or not but we sometimes have a gut feeling that it didn't feel well so whenever you have that feeling 
that what this person just said to me or what this person just typed to me doesn't feel right, tap into that feeling to see if you are if or if you are experiencing racism, discrimination, or even a microaggression, because about 60% of the time it is a microaggression. Okay. And these are other examples that you guys can kind of take a look at. Um, but I just want to kind of provide one example. And so other examples of microaggressions. Um, one, wow, how did you be become so good in math? And so it is unusual for women, for a woman, especially a woman of color, to be smart, smart in math. So if somebody says that to you, then that's kind of insinuating that, wow, you know, I can't, I can't believe you're smart in math. And another question is, why can't you believe I'm smart in math? Why? Because I'm a woman or because I'm a person of color or I identify as American of African descent. Why can't you believe that I am good at math? Um, another one that is really common that gives a lot of debates is when I look at you, I don't see color. And, you know, most people will say this statement to kind of denote that we are all humans and we are, it's only one human race. And I agree with that 100%. But sometimes this comment can come off as demeaning and dismissive to the other person. So we just have to be more mindful about what we're saying and how we're saying it, because it might impact one person differently than 10 other people. And we have to be concerned about that one person. Um, another example is a white person clutches their purse or locks their door as a black or Latinx passes by them. This is kind of insinuating that the person of color is presumed to be dangerous or having a criminal base background based off their race. And so we don't want to do that, right? In our behaviors, it's like when you're playing a game and you're on esports and you move away from a group of people that you kind of know who they are, but their avatars are different, but you actually know who they are behind um, the digital screen and you might not want to play with them or you kick them out the, the group, right? So all of these behaviors can be seen as being dismissive and it might be an underlying microaggression to that behavior. And so macroaggressions, Macroaggressions are a little bit more notable, um, and there is usually a overt aggression toward those of another race, gender, or culture. And you can you can you can identify it blatantly that it's a microaggression. I mean, a macroaggression. Microaggressions are a little bit more subtle, and you kind of have to do a little bit more reflection to see how this person said it. But a macroaggression, you can pretty much tell um, that it was meant to be hurtful. Um, so, for example, a statement could be a man refusing to wash dishes because it's saying it's a woman's job. So that clearly states, you know, some type of notion toward traditional roles for men and women. And so having that statement and saying that can be seen as a macroaggression and hurtful and aggressive to a, a, a woman, for example. And so I want to kind of open it up to see if anybody wanted to um, share, like within the chat, an experience with the with the microaggression um, that they've had based off some of the examples that I've given so far. Do we have anybody that wants to share one? Well, um, I, I will share, um, Professor Turner. So uh, a, a question came up just now, um, saying, uh, you know, how how does um, you know, a microaggression apply in the competitive gaming aspect of esports. Uh, so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of training to get to the actual tournament feel or competition feel. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you could provide sort of a sample to our audience um, how they can experience this, and it could be that they haven't experienced something like this in a subtle way where it's been something maybe numbing to the point where it's already innate. Um, please share if you don't mind. Okay. Um, and so it, just so I can clarify the question is just basically trying to go to the next level in a tournament and kind of being hindered from doing that. Yeah. In, in some shape or form capacity, um, if you can share an example. Um, so that way, uh, they can properly identify. It sounds like there's a identification uh, support and help that they need. Okay. Um, so for example, say for instance, you have an avatar that um, has like a big shield on it, has a lot of weapons, um, looks really nice. Um, and more than likely based off attraction of the avatar, what it looks like, if they're able to do moves, jump up and down, 
you might be more likely to invite that avatar in to play with you and your team as opposed to an avatar that does not have those different characteristics. It doesn't have like shield, it doesn't have swords. Um, it just is basically a basic avatar. And so sometimes we, uh -huh. okay, okay. Support roles. Ah. Okay. 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 So okay. So that's a really good example. I'm not for sure if everybody heard it, but it was referring to support roles and kind of classifying those roles as women as opposed to um, looking at those roles as also being for men. And so the idea that, oh, since you're a woman in the game, you're automatically going to be in that role of supportive as opposed to being like the main role or the main character. That can be an example of a microaggression that you are inadvertently saying that this support role is classified for women as opposed to both genders or fluid gender, right? We, we also have that different um, concept now as well as kind of looking at, you know, different um, gender orientations that we kind of have to take into um, consideration. And so if we have a supportive role and it's classified as being a woman, that does not necessarily mean it's for a woman. We have to be open to say, well, who would like to take this role? And who do you assume to take this role and kind of open it up to more people to kind of have like an open discussion about that and not just automatically assuming that it's for a female or a woman, for example. So that could be an example of a microaggression in esports. And it would be really good, you know, for people to kind of um, become more aware of these different things of how you can kind of be inclusive in the game and exclusive to certain groups. Um, also looking at like the background of the esports and like what, what you have on your on your profile picture, right? Making sure that it's inclusive to other groups as well. Um, kind of reflecting different cultural backgrounds instead of having like a um, what kind of comes up for me is like maybe an all black background. Maybe you can have multiple colors so that you are, you know, yes, I get that the concept of what is going on in the world today. We want to support um, Americans of African descent, but also to be inclusive of others as well. Right. And so the kind of talk about how we make that transition is important in our prof profile pictures and our avatar and also the content of the game. So I'm not for sure if you guys can choose like the scenes that you go to. Sometimes, you know, choose a different scene, you know, go to a different level that you've never experienced before that you don't have experience with, because that can also be a type of microaggression that you're choosing something that you're more familiar with, as opposed to trying something new, because when you try something new, you're more likely to meet more people, for example. All right. So those are a few examples. Hopefully they, you guys can kind of relate with it. I'm not as familiar with the actual game, but I think those were good examples of that. Yeah. It, it, okay, excellent. Yep. All right. And so in general, um, consequences of microaggressions, it can definitely lead to um, detrimental cognitive, emotional, and psychological health problems. And this is a big one, especially if you are isolated playing a digital game, such as esports, and you don't have interaction with like your family members close by you. Sometimes if you play on campus, you're more likely to be next to your friends. But if you're at home right now due to the health pandemic, you're more so isolated. And so just understanding that some of the words that we use in our chat can resonate with the other individual without it being processed. And so they can have an emotional experience and not even know that they're angry, but then it shows in their behaviors that they're angry. And so we kind of have to tap into that to make sure that, you know, what we're saying in Discord, what we're chatting about is welcoming to other environments. And so if they notice that a particular player that identifies as American of African descent and they win and they say, they, you don't want to say something about their race because they won, right? You want to say good job or G, I think it's GG, good game, right? I think it's good game. So you can say good game to that individual as opposed to referencing their race. And so if you reference their race or their nationality, 
um, then that could be seen as a microaggression, which can lead to feeling um, emotional or cognitive uh, decay mentally. And so, so we have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and sometimes it can also make individuals feel powerless, like they don't have any power, invisible. And so that's kind of related to the isolation aspect. And sometimes within academics, and so um, you want to learn different skills from esports, the skills that you learn within playing a game that can be transferred into an educational environment. And that's the goal of esports, is that you learn how to work with others, you learn to collaborate, you learn teamwork. And so if you are learning any racist or discriminatory content and you're sticking to that and you're isolating in that, that can transform into your academics. And then you can experience it even more so in person within your inter and intrapersonal or relationships. So we kind of have to keep that in mind that we don't want to be forced into compliance because of what we, what somebody told us or what we're used to. We want to think about what is right, what is healthy, what is healthy um, communication, what is intentional language that we can share with other individuals. Um, also, it can lead to a loss of integrity. And these things are internally, what you can experience internally. Um, it can also lead to pressure to represent one's group. So if you have a particular population that is playing esports as opposed to another population that is not playing esports, you don't want to come into that game and assume the culture of the other players. You want to be who you are, however that is. If, you, if you're colored, not colored, yellow, blue, whatever color you are, you want to be who you are because we are all made differently. We all have a unique um, genetic makeup and how we kind of interact and our language that we use. So we want to share that with our players, especially when we're playing online, because that's how we're going to get to know people is if we're different and not all the same. And so how to practice mindful and healthy behavior. So first, it starts with the self. Self is very important. If you are not able to kind of tap into how you feel, there's no way that you can build a network with a team or with other people. And so I would definitely encourage you all to increase positive affects and use positive statements in discord like hey good job you are great you're awesome even if you didn't win or get the points that you want still use that language because it motivates the next person to come back and try again but if you say wow you did a bad job it kind of decreases their motivation to come back and try again so i think using positive language and positive words um in the discord will kind of help us develop that internally and then we can share that externally um, also, just for your own um, well-being, I would suggest gratitude letters. Like you can send like a message. I'm not for sure how long the message can be within the game, but you can send a message to another player. Like, hey, I noticed that you were playing today. You did a good job. I like your new avatar. Like we can discuss that dialogue of how we can share and acknowledge what other people are doing well in the game. And I think that could be done through letters, through writing, um, especially since it's digital. Also, coping skills. So, you know, taking frequent breaks from playing on esports, not playing for a long period of time is good so that you can kind of maintain your own emotional regulation, that you're not getting too engaged in the game. Because research shows that when you're paying, playing esports, you, you have an experience of being embodied with the characters that you're interacting with. And so if you are engaged in the game, nothing else exists. You can't hear anything. You can't hear mom asking you questions. You can't hear your sister asking you questions and you're only focused into the game. And so sometimes you have to kind of step away from that so that you could become balanced and so that you won't lead into unhealthy behaviors of playing. Because we want to also promote a balance of playtime. Um, also the interaction between the environment and the humans. So whatever we interact with, it's always going to lead to some type of development internally. So whenever you're playing with different characters, when you're playing with supportive roles, when you're discording online, all of that is interacting with you as an individual. And so you have to kind of um, stay in tune with how that influences you as an individual when you're interacting with people in person. And so um, sometimes it'll, it's easier to be um, a little bit more mean or harsher online as opposed to in person. So that means that we're more likely to do it online than in person. And so we kind of have to tap into that to make sure that we have a balance of that. Um, and we want to choose like meaningful objects and, and um, different do different actions that mean something to us, right? If we choose a certain avatar or a certain color, that actually means something to us. And we, I would highly encourage that you kind of 
stay in tune with what that means to you, that color that you chose, that avatar, that shield, that sword that you chose, you know, the group that you chose. What does that mean to you as an individual? Um, and then also it can help you with object control. So your ability to kind of develop gross and motor skills. And, you know, the more exposure that you have to game, the more likely you're going to get skilled in it and the more likely your performance is going to increase. And so that also has an influence on what is being developed is your resilience, your perseverance, um, your ability to get along with others. And all of that is developed while you're playing. And I think we can um, kind of um, be more aware of those behaviors so that we can improve them if you see that they need to be improved. Um, and then so socially, right? So how we interact with others, which is also in, of importance is that we want to seek mentorship, you know, reach out to your team leaders, reach out to the committee members, if you're having any issues, you know, reach out to them to see, get suggestions and to get advice. Also to form teams and practice social leadership. Like esports is not just a game. It is, it is a, a function toward your education and your development of social leadership. How are you gonna lead your team members? What are you gonna say to them? How are you gonna communicate with them? Everything that you do digitally is gonna transform to in-person in your work environment, your home environment. So you all are all practicing social leadership and you want to um, kind of value that experience. Also create ethnic representation within game development or content. And I kind of gave an example of the avatars that you can create kind of being a little bit different than usual. Try a different avatar today that you didn't try like last week. I think that will help you to kind of diversify your experience. Um, also use intentional language um, such as good game, Encourage dialogue in your in your classrooms because I know sometimes you guys have workshops where you kind of talk about the game. So increase that dialogue to talk about where we can identify different microaggressions, where we can identify different social threats, so that we can improve and create a, a safe space that is also a brave space that people can join that have never played before, like me. I've never played before, and I can join and feel comfortable in my ability that I don't have any 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 experience with it, but I still feel comfortable to join the game and play with you guys because you invite me in. And so you want to invite others in so that it can spread around the nation and that parents and also um, instructors and faculty and um, district attorneys and, and uh, district principals can see that esports is needed within education because it kind of helps um, with the new technology and the students that are kind of getting engaged into the technology. Um, and also just seek diverse ed educational opportunities. And that could be through these workshops that we do on here or just going to different classes and just conversing with different people that reflect different backgrounds. And so I want to leave you all with a message. One, use your voice to lead. Use your voice to lead. Once you empower yourself, you will empower others. If you think it's a microaggression, it probably is a microaggression. If you think it's a microaggression, kind of look into it. Ask that person, what did you mean by that statement? But you do it in a healthy way. And then practice self-care and show compassion towards others and also yourself. And that concludes my PowerPoint. These are my references. And I'll pass it over to Ruben. Excellent. Oh my goodness. Uh, Professor Turner, thank you so much, honestly, with leaving us with um, your feedback and also uh, your final words too on top of that. Uh, there, there was a lot of good um, chat communication uh, during our time here in our session. Uh, I just want to um, keep encouraging you all to keep dialoguing. Uh, something that really resonated with me just now is uh, have that brave space and safe space. Uh, that was something that I even saw in the chat as well. Um, also, the, um, the piece of uh, motivation, right, and talking and communicating. Um, how we, um, there's, there tends to be like a cycle of sometimes negative talk seems to quote unquote motivate, which in essence, it, it's a bad cycle that we need to break uh, in the world of esports. Um, so I appreciate the ones that actually did chat that and started talking uh, about that in the chat. Um, so this is our opportunity. So when I share this with you all, as we are channeling uh, and broadcasting this um, session uh, to start thinking differently, right? 
Um, if there is a lot of people doing the same thing that isn't necessarily helpful for our own minds and benefit to help others, then uh, we need to do something different. So I encourage you all to think differently and to feel that you have a brave space to actually go into as you uh, later on go into your esports community and uh, get online and play competitively or casually. So without any further ado, I just want to thank you, Professor Turner, for your time. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, please show some love, if you don't mind, in the chat box for Professor Turner. Thank you. Uh, we can keep the dialogue going. Um, by any stretch of the imagination, we got to keep going. we got to keep working. So um, thank you, Professor Turner. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah. And I look forward to any other discussions and just encouraging open dialogue. Excellent. And, and a quick, uh, really just one thing to point out too. Um, we couldn't do this production without uh, Yusuf Andrews, who is okay. in the background doing the production and uh, his creative mind able to present this content at this level. So I want to thank uh, Yusuf, who's in the background. Um, thank you so much uh, for your help and support as we continue uh, this work. All right, everybody. Thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Excellent. Hey. Hello. Hey, everybody. This is Yusuf Andrews here. Thank you again for everybody for tuning in and checking out this uh, open mic session on a little bit of social justice. Um, just wanted to drop you guys off with a couple of sites here. Uh, if you can go ahead and check out our website, we do have a website. Um, on this website, you can find out and learn a lot more about us. Boom, yeah, up in the chat, there you go. On this website, we have our about section as usual. We have our recent news and all of our events. You can find out more by reading our missions, our objectives, checking out our four domains, checking out our cabinets. You can also check out our teams. This is a good resource to reach out to anybody on our team to ask them any questions or find out if you're uh, interested in also joining the team, support multiple games um we have league of legends overwatch there's smash brothers we also have speed runners and even though we have smash brothers we support all kinds of fighting games i myself am a street fighter 5 player so don't be afraid to suggest any games to support uh when uh, joining us or reaching out to us i also want to point out that we have a youtube channel where we post all of our archives all of our past events all of our promos and all of our special announcements and whatnot. You can take a look at some of our previous eSports uh, e uh, guest talk sessions, some of our um, tournament performances in uh, games like Overwatch and League and a lot of our speed runs. Go ahead and drop that in the chat. And we also do have a Twitter channel. Hey, shout outs to the uh, Pride logo. I, this is the first time I'm actually seeing this. It's actually pretty cool. I'm glad we got to experience that with each other. <laughs> Go ahead and check out our Twitch channel if you have, or our, our Twitter channel, if you, or our Twitter page, excuse me. If you have a Twitter, go ahead and drop a follow. Um, we post up uh, how many events we're going to be having, when we're going to be having them, and a little bit of details. You find out the people who are also supporting us and find a lot of our members on here as well as always guys it's been a pleasure feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions and we look forward to seeing you around stay tuned have a good weekend and have a good night